So how to study pediatrics in medical school? And this question seems to be a little bit neglected because I browsed YouTube a lot before I started pediatrics and I found out that many videos are made about internal medicine and many videos are also made about surgery because many people uh, are excited to start it because of the medical shows and TV dramas. But no one really seems to be talking about pediatrics so it's a little bit neglected and hence I'm making this video for my colleagues who are starting their clinical rotations as well as for any medical students around the world. So I hope this can be helpful to you. So let's get started now with the references. Now a major concern for us when we want to look for a reference is that we don't want a book that's too large to be useful and for us to go through it and retain all, all of that information. And also we don't really want a reference that's too small that it's no longer really informative or beneficial in our uh, knowledge. So, to start recommending references, I would recommend this book, which is the one I started with in my fourth year of medical school, which is The Illustrated Textbook of Pediatrics by Tom Lissor, I hope I'm reading this right, and Will Carroll. So, it's a book from the UK, and just like it really says in the title, it's illustrated. And this is a major point that pulled me towards this book, because when I started the rotation, our department uh, really recommends Nelson's Essentials of Pediatrics, which I will address in a, little, in a little bit. And when I saw the book, I found that it's it's quite large, it's about 800 pages. It didn't really have any pictures, it didn't have any illustrations or uh, or ways of illustrating that information, so it was really dry and condensed. So it did not really pull me towards that uh, book, especially that at that point, I didn't really like pediatrics, I didn't think I would enjoy it. So I was not so motivated to start reading such a big book. Of course, that changed after I finished the rotation and then I liked the specialty and I decided to pursue it further. And this is why, of course, I bought it afterwards. But to start with, when I found this book, I thought it was perfect because it offers many illustrations and many figures to display the information and make it relatable. So if we look at pictures like these, you can find that it displays the information with figures, with tables, and with also supplementary texts to make the information stick to your head. So this, is, this was really uh, a major advantage for me. So this book, of course, it's only about 500 pages, and it has just the right information for the most part uh, in pediatrics. Now, the medical student may ask, well, does this cover what I will be asked about in the exam? Or does this cover what will be relevant to me in real life? And of course, to answer that, I think we should all know that there is no single book that will cover everything that we need to know as medical students or as future physicians. But I found that at least for our level in uh, fourth year or fifth year medical school, this covered the vast majority of what is required for us to know. I would say about 80 or 90 percent. And when I compared it to the lectures that are given by our department, I found that it covers the majority and there is really a lot of overlap. Another advantage of this book is that it's really up to date. So there are many drugs which are recently um, released, like uh, the cystic fibrosis drugs such as uh, Eva Kaftor or Luma Kaftor that were not really covered in our lectures but they were still mentioned in, our, in this book. So this was something that was really impressive for me. Of course, you will, in any book by the way of these books that I'll be mentioning, you will always need to supplement it a little bit with uh, external information from other sources like Google, Medscape or the lectures that you take. Okay, so if we look at Down syndrome as an example, which is a classic topic in pediatrics, and see how it's explained in both of these books, we look here and we can see that it starts here by explaining Down syndrome, the classic features, and on the other side, you have all of the pictures that you need. Here you are shown the classic facial features, the single palmar creases, the sandal gap, and you also have commentary right here. So... It teaches you while showing you pictures at the same time. And for such a topic, it's really necessary because dysmorphic features need to have pictures for you to understand what they mean. You can't really explain them well by text or by talking about them. But if we look now at Nelson, 
at the same chapter, which is genetic uh, syndromes and inherited disorders, you can see that the way it explains Down syndrome is completely different. Here you see it's full of text, and you, they simply verbally explain these features. So it just, they just talk about, you know, uh, epicantic folds, single palm creases, the facial features, epicantic folds, and so on. But you don't really have um, uh, images to explain to you or to really show you in practice how they look like. So you may say, well, you can just use Google and find these images online. You can do that, of course, but I don't think it was really practical for me. It would take more time. And of course, you are now more susceptible to being uh, pulled by Facebook and Instagram and so on while studying. So this was something I didn't really want, and I thought it was really more practical, and it would give me more motivation to find a book which simply, uh, simply shows you all of that information in one place. Now, the second book that I used by the end of the fourth year, after I finished a large portion of this one, and I thought I need a little bit of more information, and uh, also many of my friends really recommended this one, which is the BRS, Board Review Series of Pediatrics. It was recommended to me by my friend um, Khalid Assam Dwayk, and it's a classic one in the US, and m many students use it. So it's really a balance between these two book types. It's a balance between the size and con conciseness of this book and between the information of that one. So it adds a little bit of information, let's say 10%. So it has some extra information here. It's more condensed, more straight to the point, and it has much less uh, images and figures. So as you can see, it's, it's more of the bullet point style, which many people like, but I didn't like at the beginning, and this is why I preferred using this one. So the nice thing about this one actually is that it's straight to the point, so as a revision tool, even though it contains the same amount of information, but as a revision tool, I preferred it a lot more because of its bullet point style. It was more concise and to the point, even though the information between these two was almost identical. A uh, disadvantage of this book is that it lacks the figures that are found in this one, So, and there are many tables and figures which are found in this one that are not found here, so this can be more user-friendly, if you are a visual person like me and enjoys looking at figures and images, while this one is more straight to the point and can be a little bit uh, boring to read, especially if you are not motivated uh, to study pediatrics at the beginning, if you did not decide to specialize in it, then uh, it will be more challenging to use it. But still, after, of course, I enjoyed pediatrics, I found it, of course, easier to use any book of these after that you know that you want this specialty. And the final one that I want to cover, like I already did, is Nelson Essentials of Pediatrics. This is a classic, and this is the recommended uh, textbook by our department. Like I said, it's fairly large. It's about 800 pages. It's filled with text material, and um, it can be tough to go through, of course, especially like our rotation was two months. And in two months, at least for me, it was already tough to go through this book. I didn't even complete it, uh, all of it. I completed like 60 or 70%, I would say. But if I had this one, I would not even continue maybe 20 or 30%. So we had to cover a lot of information in a short amount of time and really cover the major points because at this point, we're not going to be uh, covering patients. We only have to know the essentials and the basics so that we would be able to have the base that we would build upon in the future in our training. So I found these textbooks sufficient to cover that. But after I decided to pursue pediatrics, I bought this one. It has some extra interesting information, some trivia, some details that are, of course, not found in these books. It's more designed for residents and uh, doctors in training. The interesting thing is that this book has um, many summaries and tables that explain to you the differential diagnoses, which are uh, often not found in these books because these are more directed towards teaching, and this is more directed towards doing. And of course, it lacks pictures, so it's largely uh, filled with tables. They are even much larger than these. So, things like this, really. Sometimes they are unnecessary, and uh, it takes a lot of time to go through. But still, it can have some interesting details. If I found, sometimes, 
if I found a topic that was not covered well in these books, I would go back to this one, which happened like I would say twice. So in difficult topics like neonatal jaundice, which is really, I think, up to this point, it is the most uh, challenging topic in pediatrics to master. So I had to study it from multiple textbooks. Actually, all of these, I studied this, to uh, this topic from all of these four books and more, just to be able to understand it a little bit more and to be confident in my understanding of this complex topic. So in such situations, you can refer back to large textbooks like this, but for the most part, for students, uh, these two would be excellent. And you can really check them out, see which one do you like most, even though this is personally my favorite. And finally, I have the handbooks, which are um, the, the Oxford Handbook of Pediatrics. And I bought this one recently as well, after I uh, decided on pediatrics. And this is really, um, it's a nice book, which is, it covers topics by, uh, by system, it covers clinical procedures, it covers emergencies, things like status epilepticus, hypoglycemia, asthmatic exacerbations. So they give you really the management and it's more directed towards doing in a concise matter where you need it in the emergency department and so on. So of course, this would be more directed towards uh, people who are going to, p to pursue that specialty. Another book that I want to mention is Herit Lane the Johns Hopkins Manual of Pediatrics. I don't really have it currently right now, but it has also a lot of good, interesting approaches towards clinical practice, just like this one. Um, things like nursemaid's elbow, because really this is a very nice uh, uh, case for emergency medicine in pediatrics. It's not really well explained in these books, but in the Harrod Lane, let's say, it would show you exactly how you would uh, treat that injury and what's the procedure. It also co uh, contains many doses, if you are interested about that, even though that's not really required at our stage in, uh, in medical school. It has also good algorithms, which can be very useful sometimes if the topic is uh, challenging. By the way, before I forget, Nelson Essentials of Pediatrics, it has an access code right here, which people can use if you scratch it off. You can use it online to access the book online. And also, there are uh, decision-making strategies or algorithms that can help you in, uh, in understanding the text further. Because there are many algorithms and the book does not really contain them, so they put them online in supplementary material. It's also found in a book called Nelson Decision-Making Strategies. Now, the last book I want to mention is Case Files Pediatrics. I don't currently have it right now either, but it's a book of 60 clinical cases that has a problem-based learning style where they show you cases, they ask you what's the diagnosis, then they explain it in two or three pages, and then you move on to the next case and the next case. I saw this one after finishing pediatrics. I don't think uh, most students while doing their uh, pediatrics rotation would have enough time to go through all of these, of course, because even I, I finished that book after I did pediatrics. So I just did it uh, in the bus to fill time. So uh, these two can be really quite good, and the rest are really not necessary, and no one can really, uh, or most people would not have enough time to go through them. This book, by the way, has a question book, which is, I think it's about 200 pages, in a multiple choice style to review the concepts which are introduced here in the book with the, of course, with the questions and the answers with their explanations. So this can be very useful to uh, reinforce the information and test yourself and your knowledge. I have reviewed the book and I took a, a quick flip through it, but I did not really uh, solve it yet, even though I plan to, uh, inshallah. So this is it for book references, but for people who do not really enjoy them and would prefer watching videos or lectures, I would recommend online med ed. Uh, there is a website online that offers free lectures for medical students in multiple disciplines, including pediatrics. And that professor has explained the most important topics in pediatrics in around seven or eight hours. So I'll put a link in the description below so you can check it out if you are interested. Now in pediatrics, unfortunately, there are many important things that we need to memorize but are easily forgettable. Things like antibiotics, drugs, developmental milestones, and the numbers that we need to memorize. 
So for that reason, I have used Anki, the app I explained in my previous video, and I designed a clinical deck that contains cards summarizing these topics and keeping them in mind so I would not forget them and keep revising them even, I, uh, even after my, I finish my rotation. So I have uploaded this deck online and you can benefit from it. Um, so there is a tag for these cards called PEDS, there is a tag called antibiotics, there is a tag called drugs, and there is also one for uh, respiratory diseases and many others. So now that we have covered uh, the references, the videos, and the clinical deck, the last thing I want to mention is that there are high yield topics for pediatrics that we need to study. So if I had to start by systems, I would say that the most important system for pediatrics to study and to master is the respiratory uh, system. So in the respiratory system, we need to study all of the upper infections, including sinusitis, uh, otitis media, pharyngitis, uh, croup, also, if we go lower, uh, epiglottitis, these are very high yield topics in real life as well in examinations. Asthma and cystic fibrosis are also musts because there is not a single pediatrics exam that will not contain uh, at least asthma or cystic fibrosis, if not both. So we need to study them well. And what I liked about this book is that it really explained them the best that I could find. In hematology, the most important topics are iron deficiency anemia, thalassemia, and sickle cell anemia. In addition to G6PD deficiency and um, ITP and uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. These are the most common and the most uh, important topics that we need to understand. In the gastrointestinal system, the most important ones are celiac disease, gastroenteritis, dehydration management. Uh, also, um, I would say Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, you know, IBD, it would be important, but not as much. In endocrinology, there are two highly interesting and important topics, which are, which are diabetes mellitus type 1, in detail, of course, and adrenal insufficiency, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So endocrine is not really that emphasized in pediatrics, except for these two pathologies. In addition also to hypothyroidism, especially congenital hypothyroidism. Now, um, the cardiovascular system, tetralogy of fallow, ASDs, VSDs, these are uh, the most commonly tested ones. In genetics, we need to know all of the syndromes. So, um, Down syndrome, uh, Patau, Edwards, Noonan, um, and many others, we need to know them well, especially Down syndrome, of course. Now for the topic of infectious diseases, the most important would be meningitis, sepsis, um, torch infections, and Epstein-Barr virus, infectious mononucleosis. These are the most important uh, ones. For the renal system, the most important would be to study very well minimal change disease, because it is uh, the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in children, and I think you will see it a lot in your clinical rotation. Of course, acute kidney injury and chronic kidney disease are important as well. As well as the congenital malformations of the renal system and of the GI system. Now for neonatology, the most important would be uh, infant of diabetic mother, neonatal sepsis, necrotizing enterocolitis, and acute respiratory distress syndrome. For rheumatology, the most important topic is HSP, uh, Henoch Schonlein purpura. So we need to know it very, very well. And also to know hemolytic uremic syndrome, which is, I think it is explained in this book in the renal system, if I was not mistaken. So that's it for how to study pediatrics. I hope you found this video helpful. If you have any suggestions or anything you want to say, let me know in the comments below. And the last thing I want to say is give pediatrics a chance. Because when I started pediatrics in my rotation, I heard a lot of bad reputation from my seniors, unfortunately. But when I started and I had a fresh look with my eyes, it was not as bad as they were saying, actually at all. So I hope you enjoy your upcoming rotation and thanks for watching.